I'm silent. Okay, excellent. So welcome everybody. Sorry for the little uh, issues of uh, communication from Spain and from Israel. Um, <laughs> we are happy to host uh, today uh, Montserrat Alonso Garcia, Dr. Montserrat Alonso Garcia from the University of Salamanca in Spain. Uh, Montserrat Alonso Garcia is an assistant professor at the University of Salamanca since 2019, where she also earned a PhD in geology in 2011. She spent seven years as a postdoc researcher at the University of South Florida in the United States and the Portuguese Institute for Sea and Atmosphere uh, in Lisbon, Portugal. <coughs> she is a paleoceanographer and paleoclimatologist with special focus on applied micropaleontology and geochemistry. Her work has been mainly focused on the North Atlantic and Indian Ocean regions on timescales from miles into recent, addressing questions such as oceanographic variability during interglacial to glacial periods of the Pleistocene, the study of past interglacials, or the initiation of northern hemisphere glaciation at the end of the Pleistocene. She's a co-author of 30 papers and book chapters and co-author of 75 conference presentations. She participated in nine research projects, being the principal investigator on one, CINEMO. As an experience in, for a mini first, she has also worked as biostratigrapher at the IODP Expedition 359 and in two projects of transfer of knowledge with the oil exploration companies in, and the Spanish Geological Survey. She collaborates in the pages ply of our working groups to study the Pliocene time. In addition, she participates as often as possible in outreach and dissemination activities and has been the organizer of several activities. So, Monse, uh, we welcome you uh, virtually this time to Haifa. Hopefully, uh, we will be able to, to host you in person. And, yeah. uh, to, and today, uh, Monse is going to talk about the Indian Ocean sea surface temperature variability and deep ocean circulation changes during the last one billion years. And uh, Pasha, can you make Monse a co-host so she can upload the PowerPoint? Okay. Okay, excellent. So just share your screen and we are set. <laughs> um... <coughs> Okay. Is it, are you seeing my work, my? No. Ah, okay, now. Excellent, now, now it seems it arrived. Okay, okay now we will see, yeah. Okay. And is it now in? Full, full screen mode. Yeah, we see. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, <laughs> thank you very much for the nice introduction, Nicolas. Um, also, uh, thank you to the School of Marine Sciences of the University of Haifa for inviting me for this talk. And uh, before I forget, I would like to thank also uh, my collaborators and in my institution, uh, because this work is, uh, would not be done without all the support from all these people and institutions. Um, so uh, uh, the, when I submitted the title for this talk, um, I, I said the last one million year, I'm not sure if you can see my pointer. Yes, we do. Okay. Um, but um, um, since I submitted the title, uh, we got more data. And uh, I can say now um, that I'm going to present the last 1.5 million years, uh, which is just a small detail. Um, um, so, as, as Nicolas said, my research journey started here in this uh, university in Salamanca, where I did my PhD in Spain. And then I moved to Florida. I came back to Europe and I 
worked for more than four years in, in Portugal, where I got the opportunity to uh, sail on um, this uh, IODP expedition 359, which was named uh, Maldives Monsoon and Sea Level, because of course we went to the Maldives Sea. Um, and um, this is uh, where uh, most of the data that I'm presenting today comes from. So in this expedition, I'll, I sailed with a very nice group of scientists and one of them from your university, indeed, here is Ori Bialik. Uh, I guess uh, most of you know him. And um, well, uh, in this expedition, we were uh, a lot of people. You can see um, here the group of scientists. And I have to say that uh, one of them uh, recently um, died. So it's um, really sad to know that he is gone now. Um, well, in this expedition, I sailed as, um, as micropaleontologist and uh, I spent two months looking at these beautiful creatures, the foraminifers, but um, now then, uh, well, or after that, I turned into a geochemist and I started to study organic molecules and other elements uh, from the sediments. Um, one of the particles that I have been studying are uh, the alkenons, which are produced by phytoplankton, by the coholidophores. Um, other things that I've been studying are um, organic molecules produced by land plants, the alkanes and the end, uh, alcohols. And um, we have also been um, studying the dust particles that we can um, observe in the sediment or that got preserved in the sediment. During uh, this expedition, um, we drilled several sites, but uh, for my studies, I have been mainly focused on site U1467 um which is uh an hemipelagic site and it, it was uh drilled at a depth of 487 meters so it's quite shallow and in this site we we tried to reconstruct temperature productivity wind input and you will see that also uh changes in in the um, bottom water uh, conditions and um, I didn't want to uh, skip the um, opportunity to mention that I'm also involved in this project, the INDRA project, with, uh, which uh, Dulce Oliveira presented two weeks ago. Um, she is um, the PI of the project and I'm also uh, the co-PI. And we are here, we are studying site U1446 in the Bay of Bengal to uh, study the uh, Indian monsoon and vegetation dynamics. So um, this is all my focus is on the monsoon. But um, what is the Asian monsoon? So in case uh, you don't know about the monsoon, I prepare a few slides um, just to introduce you to this topic. Um, the uh, word monsoon means uh, season in Arabic, and uh, it refers to the seasonal shift in precipitations and wind patterns. Um, so annually um, in South Asia, they have strong precipitations during the summer and a very dry period during the winter. And um, also, along with these changes in precipitation and less known, I would say, um, the South Asia also experiences uh, strong changes in, in the winds. So during the summer, there is uh, these winds, these Southwest winds, which bring um, the humidity from the sea to the land. Whereas during the winter, um, they experience these Northeast winds which are um, bringing the, 
um, well, uh, not bringing the humidity <laughs> better. Uh, so they are just blowing from the land to the continent and that's why it is dry. Um, but what causes the, the Asian monsoon? Traditionally, this has been attributed to the differential heating between the land and the ocean. So I wanted to show you here two, um, two maps with the temperature in July and the temperature in January. So you can see the difference um, between the temperatures in the two seasons. Um, but it turns out that if you just look at the, at the sea, at the ocean, the temperature doesn't change that much. Uh, what really changes is the temperature on land. During the summer, we have very warm temperatures on land, whereas during the winter, we have uh, rather cold or mild temperatures. So this is really what is uh, driving these monsoonal changes the uh, temperature change on land. And so during um, the winter, we have these northeast winds that you can also see in the picture. Whereas during the summer, we have these southwest winds. But uh, this differential heating is not all. Um, the Asian monsoon is also um, a consequence of the migration of the intertropical convergence zone which during the boreal winter is located slightly southwards of the equator. Whereas during the summer, uh, the intertropical convergence zone migrates further north. And in this region is uh, where the intertropical convergence zone goes uh, much further. Um, this uh, intertropical convergence zone is the uh, climatic equator. Uh, this is where the winds converge. And this is uh, where all the clouds and the convection is generated, as you can see in this image. So um, this, um, these winds, when these straight winds converge, um, it, ideally, it's in the uh, equator. But this um, Hadley cell circulation is moving throughout the year due to insulation. So uh, insulation, as because the Earth is tilted, as uh, insulation is warming either hemisphere, um, this Hadley circulation is also migrating. And that's why uh, during the summer, this ITC set is moving northwards and then the trade winds are turning and going towards India. So uh, just uh, summarizing what uh, is uh, the in interest of us is that in the Maldives and in Southern India, what we have uh, during the summer is this Southwest winds, which are blowing in this direction. During the winter, we have the northeast winds. And during the intermonsoon seasons, we have these wirky jets, which are usually blowing uh, um, to the east, but sometimes they can be reversed. And they can be reversed due to uh, the Indian Ocean Dipole. This Indian Ocean Dipole is an um, it's a couple ocean uh, atmosphere um, phenomenon, and it accounts for 12% uh, of the sea surface temperature interannual variability, but also for the shifts in precipitation in this region. So you can see that during the positive mode, we have these uh, equatorial winds that are weaker or even reverse going to the west. And there is weak or sometimes even no upwelling in the Arabian Sea. And we have uh, uh, abundant uh, rainfall in East a Africa and also uh, in Asia. So this uh, Indian Ocean Dipole affects mainly the uh, intermonsoon seasons and the summer monsoon season. During the negative mode, we have an opposite situation 
so uh, the waters are colder in this uh, region. And so we have very intense uh, Indian Equatorial Ocean uh, westerlies and also uh, a strong uh, upwelling in the Arabian Sea and uh, abundant rainfall in Indonesia, uh, Australia, and also in the South China Sea. Um, so uh, from an oceanographic point of view, we can also say that there are changes uh, um, with the changes in the monsoon seasons. During the summer monsoon, we have this prevalent current towards uh, the east, whereas during the winter monsoon, we have this prevalent current towards the west. And uh, this is going to affect the Maldives because the Maldives are here and we're going to see changes in the currents that are flowing through the Maldives. And last but not least, we have um, the oxygen minimum zone in the Northern Indian Ocean, which is one of the largest oxygen minimum zones in the world. And this uh, oxygen minimum zone is produced by uh, the high productivity in the Arabian Sea, but also by the uh, low salinity layer that is created in the Bay of Bengal um, due to the precipitation. When um, this oxygen minimum zone gets expanded is during the summer. And we can see that this is uh, going to change also with the glacial interglacial periods. So um, here uh, you can see um, section, an oceanographic section of the Indian Ocean from north to south. And here are the Maldives. And you can see that the bottom waters of the Maldives Sea are influenced by this oxygen minimum zone. Um, and whenever we are having these uh, expansions and contractions in the oxygen minimum zone, we are going to see uh, less or more ventilation, depending on what we have. And so when the oxygen minimum zone is expanded, ventilation will be lower. And whereas when the oxygen minimum zone is contracted, we are going to have the influence of this uh, subantarctic mode water, which is going to bring more ventilated waters to the Maldives uh, bottom ocean. So when did the Asian monsoon started? This was a primary objective of the IODP expedition 359. And um, we drilled all these sites in order to get a better interpretation of the uh, sedimentary packages that are recorded in the Maldives inner sea. So um, one of the main things that we wanted to know was um, the age of those sedimentary boundaries that you see here with different colors and the environmental interpretation of the different packages of sediment. So um, one of the main conclusions of this study was that before 12.9 million years, there was a proto-monsoon, um, like the monsoon we can see now, but very uh, light. And then after 12.9 million years, the OM set get expanded uh, because the Asian monsoon got really strengthened. So um, this monsoon was very strong during the upper Miocene and the Pliocene, and then started to reduce a little bit during the Pleistocene. And uh, what is bringing the, the Asian monsoon and this strengthening in, in the monsoon is, um, on one hand, the uplift of the Himalayan and Tibetan plateau, which uh, started this um, uh, Somali jet and started with uh, the monsoonal winds. But then during the middle and late Miocene, the uplift of this other region, the East African and Middle Eastern uh, topography 
was what uh, enhanced the, the Somali jet. So that's why uh, after uh, the middle mild scene, the monsoon got really enhanced because of the uplift of this region. But now um, we're gonna focus on the uh, Asian monsoon during the Pleistocene. And because we are moving to the Pleistocene, uh, I'm just uh, going to give you a brief overview of the climate during the Pleistocene. At the beginning of the Pleistocene, the Northern Hemisphere uh, glaciations started and uh, 41 kilo year uh, cycles between glacial and interglacial periods started. So um, for a long time, we, uh, the Earth experienced this 41 kilo year glacial interglacial cycles until the mid Pleistocene transition, roughly about 1 million years ago when um, the glacial periods started to intensify and started to uh, get longer. So um, the 100 kilo year uh, cycles started to emerge. Also, I'm oh, sorry. Also uh, at this point, uh, more or less at about 500 uh, kilo years ago, um, the mid Brunus event also made the interglacials warmer in many uh, regions in the world. So keep in mind this, especially these two um, events, because we are gonna see uh, how these events affected the Maldives and the monsoon. So um, after the expedition, one of the first things we did was uh, the XRF scanning of the cores. And it turns out that um, this XRF scanning was very good to make the splice and to correct all the, um, the correlation between the different cores. But also because we could see, we could clearly see the terrigenous input with some of the elements like the iron or the silicon, uh, we could track this terrigenous input. Um, this record was published in this um, article by Kunkelova uh, and collaborators in 2018 in Progress in Earth and Planetary Science. And in this uh, article, um, we, um, well, it, it was um, the lithogenic material was uh, derived mainly from the Aeolian input. And so uh, although uh, we can have a small contribution from the riverine material, we demonstrated that the Maldives record is mainly uh, reflecting the aridification and the winter monsoon strength in this region. So uh, now that we know that there is high Aeolian input during the glacial periods and during the stadials, we can perform uh, an H model for this, uh, for this site. And we correlated this iron record with the benthic oxygen isotope stack to do the H model. The benthic oxygen isotope stack is reflecting the ice volume. So um, we have always this higher Aeolian input during the glacial periods. And later on, we also uh, corroborated this H model with the records that were published by Steinbank and collaborators in 2020. So this H model um, with the XRF was even better than the one we could do with the isotopes because um, with the benthic, uh, the benthic foraminifers were disappearing after this. So there is no record in this period. And the plantic foraminifers below uh, stage 13 have a problem with um, preservation. So um, at the end, the iron record is the best record to correlate with um, this uh, benthic oxygen isotopes stack. 
So let's go with the uh, sea surface temperature record of the Maldives. And before going with this, um, I just want to um, give you a small overview about how we did this reconstruction. So we analyze alkenons, which are uh, lipid biomarkers produced by covalitophores. And the SST estimations were um, calculated using the UK37 index. This is an index in which um, we compare uh, the dean saturated and the trin saturated alkenons concentrations. And so um, this index, it has been demonstrated that it correlates with temperature. And we, to convert the index into temperature, we use the Sonsoni and collaborators equation, which is specific for the Indian Ocean. So here you have uh, one of the chromatograms of the samples. Um, these are the D and 3 saturated alkenons. And here you can see the other compounds that we will see later, the alkanes and the end alcohols. Um, this uh, sea surface temperature record, well, first, before uh, going to see the sea surface temperature record, I have to warn you that um, the Maldives seasonal uh, sea surface temperature change today at present is less than one degree. So um, you can imagine that we are not going to see big changes in sea surface temperature at this place. But uh, I can um, show you this record and you can see that even though the changes are small, we do see changes in the temperature. So um, the two noticeable things in this record are this, um, before the mid Pleistocene transition, um, the temperatures were rather constant and glacial and interglacial periods are not very noticeable. The first really cold uh, period is um, this MPT, MPT transition. So a stage uh, 24 and 22 were uh, rather cold compared to the previous temperatures. Then we have an interval in which we can see uh, changes in the temperature, but not very, um, with not very high amplitude. And then at the MBE, the mid Brunos event, we can see that we start having larger differences between glacial and interglacial periods. Um, I'm sorry because we don't have this uh, first part of the record, uh, but we're having problems with uh, the colleagues um, that were producing this data. And so we are still don't have this part. Hopefully we will have it for the publication. So part of this record has been published in uh, 2019 in this article, but back then we only had the record until more or less here. So we didn't know that the, the record before this was going to surprise us in this way. Um, when we compare the Maldives record with the Arabian Sea and other tropical records, like this one from the South China Sea, and this one from the West Equatorial Pacific, we can see that in the other records, the sea surface temperature change is larger than in the Maldives, which is not surprising. But um, the thing that uh, it's uh, really more important is that we can see the same events. So we can see the mid Pleistocene uh, transition as a very strong cooling event in all the records. Then after this, there is a small variability uh, between glacial and interglacial periods, like before the MPT. And then at the mid Brunes event, we start to see uh, higher amplitude variations in the sea surface temperature in all the records. So all the records are coherent in this sense and we are still debating the interpretation of these changes because um, in the Indian Ocean, it may be related to this um, 
Indian Ocean Dipole that I told you before. Uh, so uh, the Maldives record could be, and the Arabian Sea record could be linked to changes in these warmer waters or colder waters so, uh, during the um, glacial periods. Maybe here the negative Indian Ocean Dipole is more uh, is stronger. And then during the interglacials, we have uh, a stronger positive Indian Ocean Dipole. Um, but this is um, still under debate, as I said, because of what we have seen previously is that the Indian Ocean Dipole is affecting this region more in a precessional way. So this is um, the record of the total alkenons which is reflecting the productivity. And this is a record from a nearby site from Florisfera Profunda, a cocolite which is uh, reflecting a stratification. So whenever we have low values of this uh, cocolite four, we have high uh, productivity and also we have high values in our alkenons record. And what we uh, suggested in this um, article is that this Indian Ocean dipole is changing these winds, the wicked jets, and this is what is affecting uh, or driving the productivity changes in this site. But this is in a shorter term. Um, so, um, but in this case, we do not see any change in the temperature according to these precessional changes. So that's why I said that I'm not really convinced that it's only the, the Indian Ocean Dipole which is driving the temperature changes, the general glacial interglacial temperature changes. So let's move on to um, the hydrological conditions uh, the long-term changes in this uh, monsoon hydrological conditions. And uh, before I go to the data, I want to uh, let you know how we reconstructed this. So for this, we are using the N-alkanes, which are uh, lipid biomarkers that come from the epicuticular waxes of leaves. So they come from higher plants. And um, in this case, we are using the every average chain length index, which is an index between um, several of these alkane compounds, the uh, alkane with uh, 27, 29, and 31 uh, carbons. So this means that um, uh, it's an index uh, that reflects if there are um, plant remains with shorter or longer chains. And this indicates the presence of C3 versus C4 plants. These uh, C4 plants are more resistant to the humidity loss, and therefore they will be more abundant if we have a drier climate. So this uh, ACL index will be high when we have more of these C4 plants, and of course, when we have uh, stronger aridity. So this is um, the record of the N-alkanes. Um, this is the total N-alkanes concentration. And what we can see comparing with uh, the iron record is that both records reflect more or less the same changes. And both of them are reflecting an increase in the uh, aridity in, in the winter monsoon at uh, more or less at the MPT at the stage uh, 22. So um, this indicates that there is higher input of um, terrigenous and also of um, plant remains. And this is uh, telling us that we have stronger aridity during glacial periods, but uh, this aridity is getting stronger towards the pleasant. Um, this is the ACL index, which I was telling you about. And here in this figure, I, I use this color code in which we have 
uh, arid vegetation in, um, in yellow and humid vegetation in blue. This is uh, another index that we used in the paper by uh, Kunkelova uh, in 2018. This index is reflecting mechanical versus chemical weathering, which in the end is also reflecting arid versus wet conditions. So always wet in blue, arid in yellow. And in these two records, it is very remarkable that both proxies are indicating uh, weather conditions always during interglacials and drier conditions during glacials. And, um, but, but they are not uh, coherent in the sense that it seems that the ACL index is reflecting an increase in the summer monsoon towards the present. Um, in the iron index, this is not that clear. Um, but I think it's very important that they are coherent in the glacial interglacial scale. And for example, um, they are very coherent in this stage 12, which is quite dry. And in the period between uh, stage 15 and 13, which is quite humid. This period is very important because uh, in the North Atlantic, it has been also suggested that during this period, there was a change in the uh, lithic um, in the lithic tools of uh, the earliest hominins, and so uh, it may uh, we may have been um, seen a same uh, a similar period in the in the Indian monsoon. So um, maybe also the development of these lithic tools. Uh, maybe a worldwide thing. So let's move on to the bottom water ventilation. The bottom water ventilation was also reconstructed using the N-alkanes and N-alcohols, which are uh, lipid biomarkers from high plants. And this, uh, in this case, we are using the HPA index which uh, reflects bottom water oxygenation because the N alcohol compounds are more pr prone to degradation. So um, the higher, uh, the lower the HPA index, the better is the ventilation, okay? And so um, in this case, we are, uh, besides the HPA index, the organic biomarkers, we are also using uh, ostracodes. We have this record from um, ostracodes from the last 1.2 million years ago, which uh, was recently published in Marine Micropaleontology. And in this record, what we see is that there are some ostracots that indicate poor uh, bottom water ventilation, which are decreasing in the relative abundance towards the present. And this is very coherent with our HPA index, which is indicating uh, an increase in uh, ventilation towards the present. So um, ventilation gets much better during the um, glacial periods than during interglacials, but on average, it looks like it's getting better across time. Also, the other thing that we can see with these two records uh, is that um, the ostracods are also reflecting changes in the sediment. So um, this is the record of um, the 8 to 63 microns fraction, which indicates that um, the, um, the particles, the dust particles uh, are increasing during the late Pleistocene. And this uh, increase in the, in the particles is also affecting the ostracod assemblage. Um, I think it is very uh, remarkable to say that um, after the MPT, we have uh, a stronger ventilation, especially during glacial periods. And this ventilation 
maybe uh, uh, enhance after the MBE, the Midbrunnen's event. And we related this uh, strengthening in the ventilation to the contraction of the oxygen minimum zone during the glacial periods and the stronger influence of the subantarctic mode waters in the, uh, in the Maldives Sea. Okay, so I think I talk about uh, a lot of things. So just to wrap up, uh, I wanted to leave you with some take home messages. So um, in terms of sea surface temperature, we see uh, two steps shift towards higher glacial interglacial amplitude um, between the glacial and interglacial temperatures. Um, the first one is at the MPT and the second one at the mid Brunes event. In terms of productivity, we see uh, strong productivity linked to uh, the precisional effect of the summer intertropical uh, gradient insulation gradient. And uh, in terms of uh, aridification, we can see that glacial periods start to show an increase in aridification and higher with higher aeolian input during the mid Pleistocene transition, which is also getting stronger after the mid Brunus event. Um, there is also a remarkably uh, weather conditions during the interglacial periods which are getting even wetter at the end of the Pleistocene. And uh, we also have uh, in the bottom water ventilation, we can see also a two-step uh, increase in ventilation, particularly during the glacial periods, which is um, controlled by the contraction of the oxygen minimum zone. And so uh, this is all. Thank you for your attention. And, and also thanks to all the people who participated in this and to uh, the funding I received. Muchas gracias, Monse. Thank you very much. Really Thank impressive you. data. Impressive data with a lot of um, things that still probably you can do out of that, right? Yes, uh, yeah, th there are still lots of things um, which are in progress. Yeah, yeah, the data from from uh, Maldives um, were close to the University of Haifa. We actually had one of our own, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, people on that ship. Yes. Um, okay, so I'm open. I'm open the the podium for questions, and we already have one from in the chat. So I will read it. I will start with that one and then everybody else who had a question, please feel free to just jump in because I don't see all the faces. So Pasha is asking uh, on total Enelken slide that you mentioned, Monse, mm -hmm. he said higher total Enelken reflects more terrigenous supply, but don't you think it would be better to use higher chain lengths like C29, 30, 31 and C33? to estimate the terrigenous supply? And how did you estimate the Aeolian input based on alkanes and alkanols? Well, uh, the, <coughs> the total N alkanes that I'm using, yeah, it's true that I could just uh, try with only the 29, 31, and 33. Um, maybe the correlation with the iron is better in this case. Yeah, thank you for the suggestion. <laughs> um, and also uh, the last part, um, I'm not sure what you mean because uh, I, I just, I'm just estimating the Aeolian input with um, the iron. The iron is the, uh, comes from the terrigenous input uh, and the Aeolian input then is also estimated with the alkanes, not with the alkanons. The alkanons are used for productivity and for temperature. Is it what you were asking? Asha, in the chat, I guess you need to write what you were asking. Yeah, you say yes. Okay. Okay, fantastic. 
Um, more questions? If somebody asks, or have a question. Hmm. Too much information. <laughs> No, maybe everything was clear. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, yes. I, um, I wonder, like, we are all talking about these uh, changes, these uh, marine isotope changes as um, global changes. And mm -hmm. I always wonder if we look at a certain area on the globe, what is its role in those changes. While they are global, you know, you have different feedback mechanisms uh, that can contribute to these um, fluctuations or they can, you know, uh, uh, shut them down. So I wonder how the tectonic uh, changes that were occurring there um, have a role in these changes that you see. I'm not talking about the, the, uh, the, the small scale uh, glacial mm -hmm. integration cycles, but the periods that uh, you, you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is a, a good um, question, because uh, indeed, if you look at the, the temperature records, for example, um, they are not really very, um, uh, they, they don't resemble the, the oxygen isotopes record. So um, there is something else going on there. And, and indeed, in many other places, you can see um, this happens also with, for example, the CO2 records. The CO2 record from the, the Antarctica uh, shows this huge change at the mid Brunet event towards higher values. But not in every place on the Earth, you can see a huge change towards warmer temperatures. So uh, indeed, um, of course, this is uh, the oxygen isotopes are reflecting global ice volume, but regionally you may have a different response. So Vitaly, you got your answer? Okay, cool. Okay. Um, more questions? Itzik, go ahead. Hi, um, Serhat. Uh, thank you. It was a great uh, talk. Fantastic. Very clear. Thank you. Very good. Um, a little question, a little ignorant question. You're talking <laughs> about terigenous supply, but mm -hmm. where do you get it from? Oh, <laughs> that, that was a, a big debate at the beginning. Um, so ideally, we believe that they mainly come from India. But I know some colleagues are also considering if this uh, terrigenous input is also coming from other places um, around in the Indian Ocean. Like even India, there is the Indus, there is the Brahmaputra, there is the continent, the subcontinent. Yeah. And the Indus and the Brahmaputra may be representing the two sides of the response to the monsoon, right? Yeah, One well, is behind um, the Himalaya, the other is in front of the Himalaya. The studies um, about the, the sediment or, or the sedimentation in the uh, Maldives suggested that um, the riverine input is rather low. So we have uh, some input. But the main terrigenous input is from the aeolian dust. Aeolian dust. So the, the thing is, and, and we are debating this with some of the colleagues, uh, they tried to do neodymium isotopes and other things to know if they could know the, the real source. But it looks like it's a mixture. And so it, it could be mainly from India, but also a little bit from uh, the um, Arabian Peninsula. Interesting, thank you. Keep in mind that during the summer, you have all these winds blowing right. from there, so. Okay, thank you very much. I think we, there is no more question perhaps. Uh, 
we close the session. Okay. And Monse, with you, actually, we're closing the entire academic year in, here in Israel. We are different than in Europe. So mm -hmm. I will be happy to send you an update about next year academic uh, seminars that uh, most probably will continue in the same um, way than it is uh, this year. Mm -hmm. Because actually there is a lot of uh, gaining by using Zoom actually for this purpose especially. So yeah, I think the pandemic had this positive thing that uh, exactly. we started to use um, these platforms more often, and and we are taking advantage of it. Especially when we are talking about seminars. So yeah. yes. So if you agree, I will keep you updated for next. Thank year. you. Okay, thank you again, and hopefully you will be not virtually with us and physically coming to visit. No, it, it was a pleasure to be here, even on Zoom. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much, Monse. And thank see you, everybody, for next year. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.